was written by, by my mother-in-law, Edith Kanako'ole. In it, it speaks about where we come from, our community of Hilo, our island, Lononuya Kea, Mokuo Keave, island of Hawaii. It also speaks about Paneeva and the tall ohia trees and the heavy rains. And it, it, it speaks of the place where we come from and that fondness for a beloved chief. I bring this chant for many other reasons, mostly for the unseen, for the spirits about us that is a, a beckon for their presence and also for their mahalo, for a mahalo to them for allowing this, for giving us all these chants. See, one of the things about these chants is that it's a huge reservoir of knowledge. In a, in these chants, we find the creation of our lands, polyp on polyp, coral on coral, forming these lands. The ranking of the gods, where they come from, we learn protocol, we learn ritual, ceremony. We learn pulling of the tree from the mountains down to the sea. I'm just a student of, of these chants, reciting them over and over and over. In that, conversation with the universe, we are asking for something, and often rewards are given, and interpretations deepen with every recital. It wasn't always like this. Back in 1960s when I lived in Honolulu, uh, there was really no, no goal, no connection. All I wanted to do was uh, surf, you know, surf, and then, oh yeah, fish, but, you know, those things weren't important. I first went to Hilo in 1971, and I recall then the rain. And everyone speaks about that famous rain of Hilo. And I, when you arrive there, you know, think, OK, a shower will just nicely greet you and cool you off. No, it was 10 days of deluge. <laughs> so yes, the uh, nature, the elements of Hilo are are right there, very prominent. But it was in 1975 that I witnessed a performance. I was standing on the shoreline at Keokaha, not far from where we live now. And there was a hula troupe dancing. And you know, here we are in Honolulu in 1975. We were exposed to a little bit of stuff. But what I heard was totally brand new. They were dancing the chants of fire. They were dancing of Pele and her sister, Hiyaki Kupolio Pele. You know, the motions of the great battles, of the great mo'o, Pane'eva, of the burning forest, the chants were on fire. That changed me. I followed that calling and I went to Hilo. I immersed myself in, into the hula, learned all the chants, 
And then I started visiting the forest to gather the quinolao, the vegetable forms of the gods, to make the lei. But now I was entering the forest now with protocol. See, the thing about the chants in this art form that we do now, think of it as that immersion in that hula. We were taught the dances, and we repeated those dances, those motions, the chants, just kept on going around and around in my mind as we continued to learn these. And so that art started to evolve. It started to become the Maile, it became the Lehua, it became the Ko. Because these chants were going around and around and recited every day, that art started to reflect that. It became a monopoly of really, of the thoughts. And it really became an easy path because direction was provided. In the chants, in the, la in the lines, we are told everything. All the answers to all the questions are really told there. So just listening to the chants and doing what it told me was really an easy path. I looked at the chants for imagery and then transforming that imagery into a tangible form. See, similar to a prayer, like on a rosary, how each little bead you repeat that, that prayer, it becomes a petition, becomes a beckoning, it becomes asking for something. That chant, same thing, like the mantras or the meditative conversation with the gods, you know, it, it is asking for something. See, the thing with all languages, they're literal and figurative. And all the various experiences that we go through contribute to that translation. Of course, I think with the constant repetition of those chants, we often are granted understanding. Same thing with the, this art form. I feel that as we print it every time, the intention or that story of why that image came to my mind is now part of that imagery. Same thing as that chant, we're placing it out there. And so in this petition, the cultural significance is released. The story is told so that the understanding continues to live. The Ohia forest, the forest that make up the most of our island, the Moku Keawe, from ocean to very high elevations, ensure that the clouds will visit. The tall trees pull in the clouds from the ocean. The clouds bring the rain. The rains come down through the forest and drip down the, the trunks and into the soil and into the aquifers. So that gives us the sweet waters that we drink. So repeating that image of that ohia, I know that that chant talks about the growth of that of the tall trees. And I know that that chant also speaks of calling in that rain. And I know that that chant is talking about that rain that delivers that moisture to that tree. So that cycle continues. So sharing that story about the lehua, about that liko, that ohia, really acts for accountability, asks for stewardship. And sharing that image again is a communication with the universe. So really, plants are the simplest forms, uh, simplest translations for a, a modern society. You know, they appear in the, all the chants about the Maile, the Ko, the Lehua. The Kapa designs is, illustrate abstract forms, interpreting the lines of the chant. The designs become the tangible forms. The imagery that you see is really the end of a long process. In the first, the chant is introduced, it is memorized, it is recited over and over. The recitals filter up into the universe. Translating that chant into form becomes that visual for you. And really, the form is really simply a translation of those chants handed down by our ancestors for a modern society. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
<clears throat> yesterday to um, slow down <laughs> and take my time. So um, my first reaction was, well, how come they just cannot listen faster? But um, I'm going to try and keep it on Hawaiian time for all of you today. Um, thank you very much for coming here. Um, translations to a modern society. Sound like I'm getting some feedback on this. Oh, by the way, for all the people that are tweeting, you guys are doing amazing right now because my iPad is off. Um, translation for a modern society. One small little speck. Um, my name is Kuha Oi Michaelani. It wasn't a part of the uh, introduction um, for a reason, but uh, it, it means rain from a clear sky. Uh, if you try and imagine that a bit, like you close your eyes and try and imagine rain from a clear sky, when was the last time you witnessed it? I'm going to try and make it happen today. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> but um, that's, that's the kind of grounding, that's the kind of culture, that's the kind of, that's the kind of wording. I can take it off. I don't need it. I can talk as loud as Susa. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the kind of grounding that was brought into my family. That was the kind of grounding that was brought into me. That was the kind of grounding that was, I was raised upon. And sorry, I, I kind of like this Madonna thing right here. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, where was I? Back, back to Kuhali Michaelani. Rain from a clear sky. Um, the literal meaning of that is extraordinary. And so it's something for myself um, that I try to live up to. There's one thing that I want you guys to take notice of in this, um, in this picture here. This picture is in Paris. Um, I got to travel with my parents uh, whenever they went around for hula trips. And so I got to go to Paris when I was, um, I look like I'm about 21 in that picture. Um, <laughs> But the one thing that I wanted you guys to notice in this picture is uh, my shoes. They look quite stylish. <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll get back to it, back to that at a later point. Um, yeah, I'm the son of the guy that spoke before me. Um, and I'm the seventh generation of a hula family. Um, yeah, so there, those are some pretty big shoes to fill. But what, we're, what I'm here to talk about today is how does all of that culture, that tradition, and the aesthetic of the Sigzain, or of his family, which includes myself, how does that translate to a modern society? Well, um, I only have one story of translation for you today, unfortunately, the best one. Um, it's Moko Keave. That's another name for, the, for Hawaii Island, the big island. Uh, Mokuo Keave, Keave Nuiaumi was one of the chiefs of the Big Island, and so they called it Mokuo Keave, Island of Keave. And that's where I was raised, that's where I was from. So I'm going to tell you about this little area where he saw uh, my mom dance and my auntie dance, uh, and that was in Keokaha. And Keokaha is a beautiful place to me. Um, I don't think there is any, any place better than Keokaha. There's many songs written about it, and I just came back from New York during Fashion Week for the past two weeks or something like that. And I came back to Kelka and I appreciated it even more. Um, so in this little area of Kelka, I was raised in the traditions of hula, the accompanying arts, the ohekapala that he spoke about, memorizing chants, and doing different cultural practices that have all engraved into my personality. And one of the cultural practices is um, the practice of planting your pico. Your, your umbilical cord, um, that, that is your connection to your ancestors before. It's your connection to your mother. It's a connection to everything that comes before you. So it's very important that you treat that with high regard. And you take that pico and you bury it under some, some significant plant, right? It just works out so perfectly that he does drawings of plants, right? So there was this ulu tree that was given to me when I was one years old. and um, it kind of just sat on the side for a little while. It, it was like growing and it was getting too big for its pot. And I think I was, I think I was around 10 years old or something. And we finally decided to plant it. And so he, he went and he went and grabbed my umbilical cord. And um, it was a father and son thing, which is really funny that they said about um, 
eating at the dinner table in the previous presentation because I was forced to eat at the dinner table all the way. I'm still forced every Sunday to eat at the dinner table. Um, and so both of us went out there and we planted this ulu tree that was given to me on my first birthday and my umbilical cord went in there and I was um, taught, told to take care of it. Now ulu is another word for inspiration or another word for growth and to, um, to enhance that feeling, um, I had my pico under there, so I had to take care of this plant. I, had to, I always looked at it, and now there's really fat fruit on it, and I'm getting really scared because does that mean I'm supposed to have kids soon? I, I, don't, think I'm, I don't think I'm ready for that, so I'm in slight denial. But that's the tree that you see up on the screen, and um, it's in my house. I look at it every day when I wash dishes. I look at it when I sip coffee, and I just stare at it. And a lot of ideas have come to me just from that tree, so I'm going to share how far this tree has gone. Um, it has built a relation to nature for myself. I feel as if I am one with the tree and I need to take care of it. If there's brown leaves on the tree, that means I need to shave my goatee. Something similar to that, you know, that's just a small thing. But um, there was one small uh, design and it was called Uluvehi Kelkaha, the beautiful Kelkaha. And being inspired by the Ulu tree, my dad wanted to create artwork based off of the uh, ulu leaf. And he, um, he called this design ulu vehi kelkaha, or the beautiful kelkaha, because, not because of how beautiful physically kelkaha look, but the beautiful situations that this print or this tree or this artwork has brought upon our family. And that was the, that was the part of ulu vehi kelkaha that he wanted to um, stand for. So being that, ulu vehi kelkaha has been one of the most successful prints ever in the 26 years of Sig Zane Designs. By the way, I'm 28, so you know that when I turned three, he was like, I, need, I really need to get another job. <laughs> okay, so um, it's the one success story. Um, and as you can see, the breadfruit, the ulu, and it's a very beautiful tree. I still rake it. I just raked it two days ago. Um, and since, since, you know, we're not, we're not really about brands here at TED, um, we're just we're about family here in Hawaii, right? So, um, so I'm, I'm, I want to introduce one of the uh, one of the opportunities or one of the family opportunities that came to the Uluvehi Kelkaha print. So, first of all, here's the Uluvehi Kelkaha print. This artwork was hand cut on ruby lith by um, this guy named Sig Zane, somebody, and I took this artwork and created the layout with the help of Keanu Okuda. She was one of my designers at the time, and. When anti, when anti opportunity came knocking at the door, um, there was another uncle that was there too. It was Uncle Chuck Taylor. So um, this Uncle Chuck Taylor came up and he, he just loved this design so much. And he wanted, he wanted it as a part of himself. And I was like, you know what, uncle? You can take it. Go do something with it. And what happened with that birth was the Project Red Shoe with Converse, and we did a Uluvehi Kelkaha collaboration with Converse. If you see inside of the sole of the shoe, sole of the shoe, that um, it says Uluvehi Kelkaha, and it also says um, Sig Zane Designs on there. Um, the fact that Kelkaha, Kelkaha, the place that I'm from, the smallest little town in Hilo, is on a shoe that went worldwide as a part of the Red Project, is such a humbling experience for me for my dad, for the fact that our artwork, that our expression, that our creativity can go that far is a very amazing, it's a very humbling thing for myself. And so I just wanted to share that one story with you guys. Now, um, our talk was Moko Kiave, the inspiration, the island. Uh, the fact that I can read it on the screen in front of me. <laughs> the inspirational island. So um, based upon all of that, as my dad has found Moko Kiave, the inspirational island, and I am rediscovering Moko Kiawe, the inspirational island. I want to share with you, or leave with you, um, one little excerpt from a chant about Pele making her way to Hawaii and going through all the different islands, all the way from Nihoa all the way down. And she finally stops at Hawaii Island. And she chooses that as her home. And she's still there today. And uh, when she started flowing, I think it was exactly 28 years ago, um, I was born about two days before that, so I'll leave you with this.
Aina ma ko i kiole ai mala lo aku a e ma ko kaui kava no ia uka hoi a kamo ali a e ma ko kaui kana lu e na lu haki kaka la e na lu e i mi ane hiki aku I hope you may find your inspiration line. Aloha. Mm-hmm.